Thank you, every, everyone, for coming. And it's a real um, privilege and a pleasure for me to be uh, talking to you uh, about focusing and Jen, Eugene Gentlin, who is the person who developed this process. I've been working with this process for um, about five years, and uh, it's really made remarkable changes in my life, which is why I'm so passionate about it. So I want to start, I just want to maybe uh, you could just wave at me if you've ever heard the name of Eugene Gendlin before this session. Okay, so a few of you, great, but not so many. So uh, I am going to uh, start by telling you a little bit about his work and then uh, we will uh, go into some exercises and you'll, I'll also share about some aspects of his life. And at the end of the session, uh, I will make some connections between focusing and this process and, and Judaism as I see it. So Eugene Gendlin was a philosopher and he was very interested in the implicit. So what is the implicit? So uh, I'd like you to imagine a pregnant, a pregnant lady Okay, so implicit in the fact that there's a pregnant lady is that there's going to be a baby born. So the baby is implicit in the pregnancy of a mother. So that's just a very uh, brief example. So Eugene Gendlin was studying at the Department of Philosophy in the, in the, at the University of Chicago. And uh, what he found was that the other philosophy uh, students and the professors they were mostly interested in uh, what we could kind of talk about as a Cartesian world. So that means a world that can be broken down into bits. You know, uh, the, you, break, you break a car down into its component parts. However, Gendlin was interested in this other kind of process, which was uh, not to do with the component parts, but much, to do with, much more to do with a sense of wholeness. So he was wondering where on earth within the university could he uh, continue with his own uh, research and his own uh, interest. So he looked across the campus and he realized that in the department of psychology, he might actually find something that was going to be more interesting for him. And it turns out that the professor of the uh, department of psychology was Carl Rogers, who I think many of you will have heard of. In case you haven't, Carl Rogers, uh, he created the person-centered uh, uh, approach to therapy, also used in coaching, also a founder of, uh, a founding father of positive psychology movement. So Carl Rogers is already very well known at this point, and he was studying uh, therapy patients because it turned out that people that went into therapy, they, some of them got better about 30 to 40% of them would make good progress relatively quickly. And the rest of them, they uh, didn't make a huge amount of progress. And people were even saying, hey, you know, should they even be going into therapy? Because they're not gonna get anywhere. So Gendlin decided to make his uh, PhD research in this, in this whole subject. And what he found was that, um, the people that were getting better, and it was evident right from the very beginning uh, who was going to get better and who was not going to get better, they were the people who were, uh, who were not getting better, they would stay very much in their thoughts and they would stay in their, in their mind and they would stay in their stories. The people who were getting better were doing something very different. So they would be talking about their situation and every once in a while they would pause and they would slow right down and they would check in yeah well i don't exactly feel like this it's more like that to have a little example for you this is the example there was a, a woman who was uh, very upset with her sister and uh, she was talking to the therapist about all the things going on with her sister and uh, she said, I'm really, really angry with my sister. 
And she was going on about all the things that the sister had done, the sister hadn't done, that made her so angry. And then she paused and she uh, went right inside. And she said, you know, I'm not angry with my sister. I'm disappointed with her. So I hope you can understand that there's a difference between being angry with somebody and the kind of responses you might get if you express your anger, as opposed to being disappointed. And when you're disappointed with someone, it's perhaps much easier to go to that person and say, hey, you know, um, this and this happened and I was expecting you to do that and that and you didn't do this and this or whatever it is. And it opens up a dialogue that isn't really available when you um, are angry with somebody because you're so preoccupied with your anger, it's often very difficult for the person to receive someone else's anger. But disappointment is something perhaps a little bit more manageable. So I'd like us to have a little experience now uh, of, uh, so uh, Eugene Gentlin, he, he, he um, as he went on with this uh, process, he realized that rather than stopping people from having therapy, which was the, uh, what other people were suggesting, he's like, no, I wanna create a process that helps everybody to have access to this kind of awareness so that a much wider population can benefit from the therapeutic process. So I want us, uh, before we have, uh, I'm going to uh, guide us into an experience uh, in, a, in a few moments, but before we do that, I want to point out that most people have ha already had an experience of the felt sense, but you may have not been aware of it or had a name for it. So I don't know if any of you have ever experienced a lump in your throat. Maybe you can uh, wave at me if you know what that experience is like. Okay, so a lot of people are waving at me, great. And uh, what about heartbreak? Who, who's ever experienced heartbreak or heart opening? So these are all examples of a very strong felt sense. Now, the felt sense isn't always as strong as that. Sometimes it's kind of vague, even foggy. And sometimes it might be, you think you're making something up. That's actually a sign that there actually might be something going on. It can also kind of blink, you know, like one of those traffic signals that is blinking on and off. You can have that experience that it's like that. So what I'm going to invite us to do now, uh, I'm going to invite you to um, think of somebody who you really dislike. Now, it doesn't have to be a person that you know personally. It could be a politician or a character from in public life. So whether it's somebody in the public domain, or whether you happen to know people that you find difficult uh, in your personal life. So you might like to close your eyes you're and feel free to keep your eyes open or closed. And I'll, I just wanna check, has everybody got a person? Okay. So, um, I want to invite you to imagine that this person is walking towards you in the room and they're heading over to you and they want to spend time with you. This person that you really dislike.
And just take a moment to be with that. And now I'm going to ask you just to kind of put that to the side, let it go, let that person go, whatever it is you need to do to let them go. And I'm going to invite you now to think of somebody who you are very fond of and you really enjoy being around, but for whatever reason, you haven't seen them for a while. And I'm sure, especially with the COVID lockdowns, we all have got a lot of people that we love to see that we haven't been able to see for a while. But it could also be somebody who's passed on. So maybe they don't even live in the same country and you wouldn't be seeing much of them anyway. So I just want to check, has everybody got that kind of a person in mind? Okay, great. And now, again, feel free to close your eyes or to leave them open. And imagine that that person is coming towards you and they want to spend time with you. And just take a moment to see how that feels in your body. Maybe you feel it in your belly or your chest or another part of your body. And see if there are some words that come that can describe this kind of a feeling. And I'm going to invite you to come back into the space and I'm going to open up the chat. And I'm going to invite you to share your experience. Some of you could put in the chat. And even if you didn't get anything or if it was difficult for you, I would also encourage you to put that in the, in the chat as well. So either from the second, the second person uh, or the first part as well. Sorry, we can only do it directly to the moderator. So I should be able, participants can chat with everyone. So some people are putting chat, uh, okay. It's going very quickly. Heart space opening, nausea. Tightness. I'm, I'm going to read these out because it's going by quite quickly. So somebody felt afraid, a tingly feeling, tightening, nausea, heart space, tightening in the upper chest for the first person, joy and openness for the second. Sadness and teary. Okay, so uh, Carolyn, you know, sometimes if you feel close to someone and you haven't seen them for a while, of course, maybe you feel sad or teary. So whatever, whatever you're feeling, it's all welcome. Difficult to visualize. Amara. So Amara, uh, I don't see you. Would you like to say more? Uh, and I'm going to ask Jonathan to unmute you. If Isn't you'd it? like. Sorry, it's um, Amarata uh, Green. Ah. Okay. That should have worked. Great. Would you like to share, Amarata? Yeah. Um, I find it really hard to visualize these encounters. And then I also noticed that the persons I had in mind that were either negative or positive, um, that I had mixed feelings for both of them. So 
for instance, the person that I felt negatively towards, once they wanted to spend time with me, I was like, um, okay. <laughs> and, 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 and the uh, positive person, uh, I, I felt that actually I also felt contradictory feelings for them. So it was, yeah, it was quite difficult to do. Right, so thank you, thank you for that. And thank you for, for sharing that. Um, it doesn't have to be a visual experience. So I also struggle a lot with visual experiences. Sometimes it's just a feeling. And yeah, I think it's great what you said, you know, sometimes things are not clear for us and we are ambivalent about people. So I really appreciate you uh, contributing and to all of you. So um, I wanna kind of dig in a little bit more and talk a bit more about what the felt sense is all about. Um, I'd like you to imagine the letter A as if a human being is a letter A. So often the beginning of uh, we keep our awareness and the bar of the A is kind of up here at the neck level. Uh, so typically all of our awareness is in our head, but in actual fact, you know, we're a whole person and there's a lot of information that goes on that comes from the body. And in fact, the research shows that there are more signals going from the body to the head than the head from the body. So there's all this information in our body that oftentimes we ignore. And we ignore it at our peril, I wanna say. Uh, this actually might be a good time to uh, share with you uh, a little bit about Eugene Gendlin's life and how he was impacted actually by his father's capacity to feel into his body uh, during a very difficult time. So Gendlin was born, I think, in 1926, and uh, he was uh, born in Vienna, which obviously in 1938 was uh, taken over by the Nazis. And he was Jewish, so uh, in fact, his father got uh, rounded up by the Nazis. He was in the local jail, and he eventually he got released, which they were very lucky that happened. And then, uh, I'm not gonna go into the full detail of the story because I could easily be talking about it for the whole 50 minutes. At the end of my handout, I put a reference where you can read the whole of the story. But anyway, I am gonna share with you this one little, uh, little aspect. So Gendlin and his family had figured out that the, their best option for leaving was actually to go via Cologne because apparently, and they had paid for this so-called safe address Somebody had given them, them this address that was supposed to be safe for them. And the idea was that the person at the safe address was going to give them uh, some help to get across the border into Belgium, where the Nazis at that point hadn't invaded. So Gendlin and his father, you know, many difficult circumstances, but they did eventually get to Cologne. They got to the safe address. And uh, Gendlin's father goes in to talk with this person and Gendlin is waiting outside. After about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, his father comes out and he's ashen. Yeah, and he's really worried and they leave the place. And then his father says, you know, um, I have a really bad feeling about this. I don't trust this man. So we don't have a solution right now. And Gendlin was really puzzled, you know, that only hope for escape, all their hopes were pinned on this safe address. And now the hopes were dashed and all because his father had a kind of a feeling about it. So he was very curious about, you know, what kind of a feeling is it that you can trust so much that you know, you know, this one chance of survival isn't it. So Gendlin was interested in the felt sense before he even had words for it. He was 12 at the time that this happened. I'd like to share another story with you. Uh, which also informs Gendlin's later work. So eventually him and his family made it to the United States. 
they got visas and they were allowed to go to the States. And uh, Gentleman was 12 or 13 at this point, but he didn't speak English. And at that time, they didn't have, you know, special teachers to help us learn a second language and all the rest of it. What they did is they put the kids into uh, classes with uh, younger children so that it would be easier for them uh, to learn the language. So here was Gendlin as a 12 year old in a class full of six year olds, and he was trying to get his head around English. And as many of us do when we are learning a language, we normally kind of look for the first, the language, uh, the name of the thing in, the, in our own language, and then we look for the translation. So in English, okay, so here is the word I know, and then I have to learn it in the new language. The sixth grade teacher said to him, hey, Eugene, you don't actually need to know what this is in German. So the example is a chair, you know, a chair is stool. You don't actually need to know that in order to know that in English, the word is chair. So when Gendlin started to look only for the English words, he noticed that there was a kind of um, a feeling or a rightness to the word chair. It would kind of land and resonate. So Gendlin was really interested in this. And I think this is one of the reasons why later on he became a philosopher and uh, went on to study with uh, Carl Rogers. He created a, a model, which uh, he called the process model. And the pro he, he talked about kind of our mainstream reality. The model is a unit model. The unit model breaks things down into smaller components. The process model, looks at everything as a whole. And that is, I think, one of his major contributions, that we look at the wholeness of things. So, uh, Jonathan, I just want to check, have there been any questions that have come in? Jonathan? No, there's no questions, no questions at the moment. Okay, great. Okay. So, um, I want to share with you uh, a couple of quotes from Gendlin. So, this is him on, sorry, this is him on, uh, do you see my screen? Hang on. Share. Okay, do you see my screen? Can somebody wave at me if you see it? Okay, great. So I'm going to read it out for you. A felt sense is not a mental experience, but it's a physical experience. Physical a bodily awareness of a situation or person or event, an internal aura that encompasses everything you feel and know about the subject at a given time, encompasses it and communicates it to you all at once rather than detail by detail. It's a big, round, unclear feeling. And the other quote I want to give you just to kind of inspire you, we're going to go into a, another exercise in a minute. It's a felt sense, it's a promise of a new piece of world. So it's like, it's new information. It's not what you already know. So before we go into the exercise, uh, I just want to um, go into some of, the, some of the ways in which focusing is, uh, is being used. So it, you can use it if you've got a problem and he created a whole process for thinking around in a focusing kind of a way. He called it thinking at the edge. Focusing can also uh, give you new insights into any kind of situation, any problem that you're facing, or if you've got an issue with a person, it can really help you to understand things in a new kind of a way. You can use it also 
to set yourself and to imagine what you want for yourself. So think about a desired future and then feel into your body how it would be if you if you get that future. It's an alternative way for interpreting dreams. It's used a lot in coaching and therapy. There is a whole strand of therapy called focusing oriented therapy. And a lot of people who know focusing are also coaches like I am, who are, are using uh, their felt sense to support people. It's not mindfulness, but it's quite close to mindfulness. And for people who struggle with mindfulness, focusing is a really good way uh, to become more aware. It's also good for people who do not struggle with mindfulness. And it's a doorway to spirituality, which we're going to be uh, experiencing now in a, in a minute with another uh, with another exercise. So before we go into the exercise, um, I want to give you the, yeah. I've got a couple of questions for you. Maybe I can just um, do this part and then I'll, I'll come to the questions. Uh, so firstly, when, when you're um, aware of the felt sense, you need to turn towards it and acknowledge it, make space for it. And then you're kind of accompanying it as if it's almost like there's a small animal inside you who you're wanting to befriend. And these small animals, they might run away if you're too fast or too quick. So you need to kind of be very gentle and extend compassion to it and really be quiet so that it's got space to uh, express itself. And the acknowledgement that, you, that you're aware of it is also a very important part. So uh, maybe I can, uh, uh, you can uh, read out the questions. So from Alexander Massey in Oxford, did Gendlin suggest our felt sense could give us information about other people? Or was it more that he said focusing on our felt sense would make us learn more about ourselves? How to distinguish between sophisticated felt sense and our bias reading prejudice of a situation? Okay, so, I think it's not so much about the other person, but it might be, uh, well, so different things. So in a coaching situation, I'm sitting there and I'm coaching somebody and I may pick up something from my own felt sense that might be useful for the other person. So that's one way it may work. It may be, so say I've got a difficulty with somebody. I remember one time I went on holiday with a friend and before we went, we were having all these like difficult because we're very different people. And I did a focusing session on it and I can't remember now the detail, but I got a lot of awareness about what was going on for me. And I was able to express it to the person and it helped shift the dynamic in the relationship. So that's another way uh, that Focusing can be useful for other for other people, but it's mostly about you in relationship with yourself. I don't. Was there another part to that question, or did I answer it? No, I think you've answered it. Okay, um, great. And I've got another question from Sharon, but maybe we can come back to that because I don't think I've got the full question. Okay. We'll come so, back. We'll come back. To okay. So so let's let's move on. Uh, I, um, I'm going to be giving you uh, another exercise in a minute, and this exercise is going to link us into um, a spirituality. So while I'm introducing it, you might like to be thinking about um, an object, a symbol that has meaning for you in a spiritual way for you. So it might be a, a ritual object. Uh, from Judaism, like a Shabbat candles or a menorah or a shofar or any other ritual object. It doesn't have to be an object. It could be a phrase or a word like shalom or peace. And it can be in any language. And it's not, uh, you know, if, if 
if you're more of a holistic person and you don't specifically want to pick something from Judaism, then feel free to, to pick something else. But something that has got meaning and significance for you. So uh, we'll be coming back to that in a minute. And uh, I just want to read out these uh, tips from uh, Gendlin. So don't tell it what it probably is. Wait for it to tell you what it is. So again, that means slowing down. And we tend to have busy minds, all of us. So you asked a question, the mind will come in very quickly. The felt sense is a much slower process. And the felt sense is very unique. So some people's process might be really slow, some people's process might be a little bit on the quicker side, but just see if you can notice the uh, and differentiate between thoughts coming from your mind and something that's coming from your body. And if you do get caught in thinking, the trick is to notice it and even to label it. Oh, there's my busy mind. And I recommend that you thank the thoughts because it's your mind wanting to be helpful. Too often when our mind comes in, we judge ourselves and that just makes it worse. So the idea is that you, oh, okay, there are my thoughts. Thank you thoughts for wanting to be helpful. And then you come back and it's this thing about making a fresh start. And when you make a fresh start, it's not where were you, but it's a fresh start. Where am I now? How does this whole thing feel now? And see if, uh, as a specific feeling that comes out of that fresh start. So I want to check, did everybody find a, a something, a symbol? Okay, great. So if you've got a pen and paper there, uh, and even if you haven't, just note it in your mind, what is it about this thing? So this is, we're not focusing now, this is just regular thinking. What is it about this symbol that makes it special for you? Okay, so just one or two words, doesn't have to be an essay. And again, now I'm going to guide you. So when I start, I'm going to guide you to bring more awareness to your body. And then I will be bringing, uh, inviting you to bring awareness to this uh, symbol that you chose. And we will just spend some time focusing on this object this symbol, because it may not be an object, it may be a word or a phrase. The important thing is it's inanimate. So yeah, just uh, take a moment. And again, feel free to close your eyes, feel free to keep them open, whatever helps you to be more present. And you might like to start by bringing your awareness to sounds that you can hear. You might like to become aware of the temperature in the room and the space around you. You might like to become aware of the weight of your body and the contact points between you and the ground, whether it's through your feet or through the chair. Just notice the points of contact, maybe your feet, maybe your bum, maybe your back. And become aware of your body as a whole. And I invite you to recognize that, you know, you're not here on your own. In some way, you're connected to life outside of you. Maybe you feel a sense of connection to other people in this Zoom room, 
the whole of Limud, people in your family, people who you're close to. Maybe you feel it through your breath. And now I invite you to bring into your awareness this symbol that you chose that has got meaning for you in some spiritual way, in some Jewish way. And see if there's something that comes, if there are feelings, you might get a word, you might see an image. And if there are a lot of thoughts, see if you can thank the thoughts and come back to your felt sense. And you might like to ask yourself, what is it about this word, this symbol, that gives me this feeling? What is it about this word, this symbol, that makes it meaningful for me? And wait, and just see if there's an answer that comes from your body, from your felt sense. And when an answer comes, you might like to repeat it to yourself and check it. Maybe it changes. Maybe you have it just right. So just take a moment to be with this symbol. And in your own time, I'm going to invite you to come back into the space. And again, I'm going to invite you uh, to put in the chat something that you experienced. And again, if you found it difficult, please uh, include that because maybe there's something for us all to learn as well. Right, so it took you back to the past, calm, safety, security, hope, calm. So I'm really interested if people found it difficult, it took me back to a great loss, the word calm came up and felt right. Solid, hard, sharp, connection to the past and the future, validation. Solidarity when I was given the symbol, felt sad and then judged, compassion, love and peace, new insights. Joy. So it sounds like many of you have got something really helpful and useful and uh, some of you struggled with it or it brought up something that was uh, challenging. So uh, I really thank all of you for contributing. Um, when we listen to our body, 
It's not always going to give us nice feelings, but those challenging feelings are in our body or in our experience anyway. So I just want to um, check, are there any questions? I've got a couple of questions here for you. Yep. Mark Bryant, does Ruth think that the ABCs of focusing relate in any way to Roger's concept of congruence? Um, probably. I'm not, uh, I need to know more what is meant by congruence. So maybe you can unmic, uh, open the mic for that. Who was it who answered the question? Mark Bryant. Let me Mark, see okay. Hold on a second. And then just whilst I'm doing that, um, from Sharon Law, earlier there was mention about A, but it was stopped in the middle, and I would like to know more. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't, um, okay, let's go to Mark first. So Mark, what was your question? Okay, well, <clears throat> I started with Brian Thorne um, with regard to Roger's um, uh, psychotherapy. And one of the things that um, uh, Roger's developed was the idea of the core conditions. Uh, and primary to those is the idea of congruence, that the person is authentically themselves. And I wondered if, with the work that Jendlin had done with Rogers, whether his idea of the ABCs of focusing in any way related to Rogers' concept of congruence. So just to clarify, um, Jendlin created a whole school, Focusing Institute, and then different teachers have put in different words and different methodologies. So the ABCs did not come directly from Jendler and I forget the name of the teacher that gave that to me, but in principle, yes, acknowledging how you're feeling, being with it and extending compassion has got to be linked to being congruent with how you're feeling. So I think it's a methodology to help you to access that congruence. And uh, Sharon, I think you had a question. Hi, earlier on you spoke about imagining an a and looking at the top of it but you stopped in the middle and then started talking about something else i was interested in what that a was meant to be oh i'm sorry i thought i did complete it so the a the person is the a and this typically we have the line across our neck the idea is to get the, to, to lower the bar so that we're getting into more contact with the, with the body i'm sorry i do apologize for that thank you so um, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to give you my take on how focusing draws a bit on Judaism. So Gentlin was Jewish. He wasn't necessarily the most um, uh, religious person. He didn't go to synagogue that often, but he did fast on Yom Kippur. So he was, and certainly as a child, he grew up in a, in a, a kind of conventional Jewish uh, Jewish family. So things were kind of um, embedded. So So this is just uh, my my take on things, and I'm really interested to if we've got time to talk about it. Uh, I'll be interested to hear from you if other things come to you. So in our creation story, yeah, the world was created and named out of the formlessness and void, the tohu vavohu. So for me, this rela focusing relates a lot to this naming things and things moving forward out of like sometimes a fogginess as we tune in to our own body. Then we have in Elijah, you know, God is speaking to Elijah with a still small voice. So again, you could interpret this felt sense as perhaps being a way that God speaks to us. It's one possibility. I also believe, I I'm not hugely experienced in um, uh, Torah study with Kavrita, but from my understanding, sometimes, not always, People are listening to what's not written in the words, but what's in the words. And I believe that focusing uh, kind of connects to that way of listening for the more. Uh, we talk about, you know, um, the, the Torah as being words of black fire written on white fire. And I think, you know, in the Midrash, the Midrashim come out of the white fire. So I think the false sense can also help us to access some of 
that which is not written, what is part of our Torah. Yesterday I attended uh, Jonathan Wittenberg's session on uh, Shema, and I realized, oh, this is focusing. Well, everything that he was talking about, I was like, yes, this is focusing. We listen. It also helps us to listen to, to others. When we listen to ourselves, we make space and create the opportunity to listen to others. And when I'm focusing with a partner and they're doing all the work, I'm also listening to myself. Because if I'm not present with myself, how can I possibly be fully present with another person? I also think there's a strong uh, connection to the work of Martin Buber, who uh, many of you will know in the book that he wrote, The I and Thou. So, you know, in focusing, we're giving this vow to our whole self. And also when we're working with another person, the other person is obviously in a state of that, of thou. And I also think that Judaism as a whole is much more uh, a, a, a context of wholeness. We don't break things down into uh, its constituent parts. So those are um, just my reflections. And uh, if anyone has any comments or questions about that, um, I'm really interested to uh, to hear from you. Okay, so while the questions are coming in, I'll um, just want to give you some places to, um, if you want to find out more, uh, there's the focusing, sorry, did I stop sharing? Uh, so if you want to find out more, there's the Focusing Institute, which is based in New York, it's international, and you can find uh, people experienced in focusing in just about every country in the world. In the UK, there's uh, the British Focusing Association, and uh, many countries have got their own uh, focusing es establishments. It's very, very big in, in Israel. These are my coordinates. Uh, and if you're interested to learn more about Jenlin's philosophy, I've put a link to a website. And I've also given you references here. You can learn more about the whole story of how Jenlin escaped from Vienna in 1938. I've, I think you might find it very interesting because at key moments, his father was doing something. His father was following his own felt sense, although he didn't have, he didn't have words for it. And I've also put a link to um, a manual which I found online, which goes into a lot of detail of all different aspects of focusing that you might find useful. So, <laughs> Comments for you. Great. Go ahead. Ruth? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the first one, a uh, comment from Alexander. There are many possible connections to Judaism, between Moses noticing and turning towards the burning bush, the idea of the back call, listening to the daughter of the voice as part of prophecy, the sacred musician who tunes himself in order to play sacred music. The sphere of Keter and Kabbalah, and the spark of consciousness that pre precedes or begins creation. Great. So, thank you. That's from Alexander. Yeah, Alexander, did you want to did you want to uh, say something about that? It's great that you that you provide all those um, uh, uh, different ways of thinking about it. I can perhaps say something just quickly. Sure. Ruth, it's been so lovely to be at your session. <laughs> My mind <laughs> in all directions. <laughs> And it's really opened me up sort of here as well in my body. It's been lovely. Great. Uh, yeah, I mean, in a sense, my, my comments there probably kind of do that very quick summary, but it seems fundamental to, if you like, one of the things that puts us in the image of God is that we are creative beings. And it's that generativity of being human, the generativity of God, the constant creativity. And at the beginning of that, and I think of this very much as a composer and writer, yeah. it's an act of, be, of being very quiet and listening and waiting and sensing and, yes. and, and going to the absolute edges of awareness to find out what's really there and what needs to be 
manifested and 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 expressed and i i find it in so many places i've listed some of the quick things there within judaism i just think amazing i'd love to continue the conversation with you at some point but... great well let's do that great so i want to um julian has made a comment he didn't follow judaism not breaking things out so i think uh judaism is a both and i totally agree with what you're saying yes we can be very analytical um can also be intuitive so i think it's a both and but i also see aspects of focusing within judaism as well as what you're saying um you know also you know when you when you study torah there are people that get that go down into the minutia but there's also that sense of listening for that which hasn't yet been expressed uh, there's two two more one more question from sharon who okay. asks is the difference between focusing and intuition i think the way i see it because there was also a question in the chat is it the same as the covenant i think focusing is a way that you can access your intuition i mean i sometimes you know um i have a regular practice i focus regularly with somebody but you know also you know i get my best ideas when i'm out for a walk on my own it's like i'm walking along and then something comes in is it focusing well it's not formal focusing uh but it's informal focusing i've created um, a map inside my body because i've been working with this process regularly for the last five years now uh i think kavana so kavana i think is interesting because it's it's about intention so sometimes an intention comes from your mind sometimes it comes from something else so this session a uh, few uh, must have been a few months ago uh i was going having you know i was kind of fi finding it quite lonely and was having a lot of difficulties with myself i went out for a walk and i'm like ruth you have a session on focusing at limud i hadn't been thinking about limud and it just came and in the recent weeks a lot of things have been changing for me so you know you take one step but kavanah is also like right i want to learn hebrew and it can come from the mind doesn't make it wrong so but it can also come from this this deeper place i don't know if i answered that question and and a marking of a question how do you know if you've wrongly named it or how can you know you haven't properly listened to it like i may be making some something up when trying to listen to my body so i think practice uh experience all of us are different so it's not possible to say it's like this so and it's also you haven't probably haven't listened to your body that much for a big chunk of your life you have to get to know yourself and you have to build trust and it takes time and yeah sometimes you are making it up but you kind of won't know until you experience it i think we're going to have to leave it there yeah. okay so i'm happy to stick around for a little while if anybody does have any uh, other questions and if you want to be in touch uh, I've put my coordinates in and also happy to chat on the Slack. But if you want to be in touch afterwards, uh, uh, download the handout and all my details are there.